So, like, just to recap what we discussed in the last lecture, we roughly discussed how to do function approximation with uh, large, when you have large state space, uh, we'll not be able to track what is the value for each state separately, right? Let's say you want to estimate what is the Q function. Uh, let's say there are a lot of states. For every state, you have to store one value, right? Which is V of S, let's say V by of S. So it is not practically feasible uh, if you have to deal with such large state. For example, if you look at the games like chess or Go, you'll have 10 power, I think chess Go has around 10 power 170 states. And it becomes uh, practically infeasible to deal with such large state spaces. So we move from what is called tabular-based methods to function approximation-based methods. The tabular-based method was for every state and value. Actually, we were writing what is the Q value. Q of S comma A for every possible S and for every possible A we were maintaining. But uh, when the state space becomes too large, it's uh, not practically feasible to do that. So we went to something called function approximation, right? Mm, and then we also looked at uh, what is called the DQN algorithm, where when you are when you involve when you start doing function approximation, there'll be some convergence issues because of these two uh, issues that uh, we have roughly discussed in our last lecture, which are called non-stationary targets and non-IAD updates. So we discussed uh, two solutions for these algorithms, which are called uh, target queue network to make sure that the target doesn't keep changing. And we also discussed this concept called memory decrease number. And let, let me spend some five minutes to go through these things again. So, by function approximation, I mean, instead of uh, uh, treating each state separately, you just uh, uh, so instead of treating each state separately, you just uh, get some features for every state. So there could be uh, millions of states, but if you have three, uh, let's say your feature vector is of length three, then uh, you have only three numbers to deal with. Right, you get some features for every state and you try to model your value function as a function of these features instead of uh, treating, uh, instead of having a separate value for every state, you just model your value function as a function of these features. For example, if you want to take it as a linear function, so if you write it as a linear function with weights w1, w2, and w3, all that you have to learn is uh, three values, right? w1, w2, w3. If you learn these three values, then we can find the value of any state, right? Because every state will have some features. If you somehow estimate this w1, w2, w3, that means uh, you know the value of uh, every state, every possible state. So this is called function approximation, where uh, if you had uh, a million states, if you're doing tabular method, you need million values. Now you just need three values, depending on the feature vector length. If you use a linear function like this, right? Mm, so, you can either do a linear function approximation like that, or you could even have some uh, neural network based approximator, like where the input is like your feature vectors of the state and the output will be some estimate of your value function. So you could either model your, let's say you are doing some Q learning kind of an algorithm. Instead of having V, v of S as the output, what you could have have, like you could uh, input the states as the features, like you could in input the state features for the neural network. Let's say you want to do Q learning, what should be the output of this neural network? Let's say you're doing function approximation and you want to approximate Q of S comma A, right? Let's say you want to approximate uh, Q of S comma A, 
let's say i give s uh, pictures of s as the input for this neural network what should be my output now uh, if you just give the state uh, features as the input let's say you have three actions you want uh, output to have three values which is uh, let's say there are two actions that are possible in your uh, in your mdp you can just have this these two as your outputs so your output will have two uh, outputs where this will be sorry so this will be the action curve this will be q of s comma a1 this will be q of s comma a2 something like that or another way could be you just input a also here and just have one uh, value as the output so you input both s comma a as the features as the input for your neural network and just get one value which is q of s comma a okay generally this approach is preferred because you just have to train one neural network uh, for all the actions together okay so how did we do this uh, function approximation like uh, generally if you want to estimate you want to you have this function approximator which is v pi of s comma w which is a function of the weights w and you want to find the best representation uh, for your value function so v pi of s is the true value you are trying to minimize the <laughs> mean square error but what is the issue that we will face when we try to do this we do not know these uh, true values right we don't know what is v pi of s we are trying to estimate that only right that means we don't know what are these true values if you know these true values then you can do gradient descent with respect to w and you can find but uh, the issue is we don't know these true values we are trying to estimate these true values right so what uh, what did we do to uh, resolve this issue because we want to do gradient descent but uh, right we want to do something like this let's say w uh, new equal to w old like just the gradient descent on the mean square error we'll get something like this but we don't know what is v pi of s so what did we do for this yeah we looked at two methods monte carlo based uh, function approximation and td based function approximation so in monte carlo based function approximation what can we substitute instead of v pi of s okay i'll just run one episode with uh, the policy pi and whatever you get you just substitute that gt you can substitute okay if you are doing td based function approximation what can you substitute yeah just take one action and just uh, we had told of st plus 1 comma w like similar like you just substitute your uh, estimate estimated value from so this is what we looked at as function approximation and then we also looked at uh, this uh, dqn which is also again a function approximation based method where we are trying to uh, estimate what is the q star like uh, if you know q star you know the policy right the policy is nothing but arg maps over a q star of s comma s right so again we'll have this uh, issue we don't know what is uh, q star right so when you don't know what is q star what will we do similar to what we have done in this td based method q star of st comma at can be written as this right this is an approximation that we can write like rt plus 1 plus uh, maths over a q hat of instead of having q you will just substitute q hat here okay so what are the two issues that we were having with this one was the thing called non stationary target right so that is uh, this this is an like this is an approximate estimate for what q star of s comma a right this is an estimate we are substituting for q star of s comma a but that estimate itself changes with w like w is what we are trying to learn we are trying to learn the optimal w but 
uh, in a supervised learning setting, let's say if you have an image, uh, the label for that image will be fixed in like you will have some training data and you will have, let's say, S comma A is the input. Uh, if you have some value of Q star of S comma A, that will remain the same irrespective of uh, during the training process, the labels of the training data will not change, right? In a supervised learning setting. You have some image and you have some label, let's say it's a cat. So the uh, image and the label will not change during the training process. But here, uh, this is like the label, right? This is like uh, an S Q, of, Q star of S comma A. This is the value we are assuming, right? And this is changing based on whatever uh, WT is. That is during the training process, the label data is changing, right? That is what is called a non-stationary target. Because it's not, uh, if you keep changing this, that means you are trying to fit to a different value. Like uh, the same image, if you had shown previously, you are telling it as cat. Now, if you show the same image and you are asking it to train for a dog, right? So this is what happens uh, if you have a non-stationary target. During the training process, your uh, labels are the, why your training data keeps changing. So this is one issue uh, which might result in uh, convergence issues. So how did we solve this issue? Yeah, so you fit some W's. You, you fit some W's. Which is called the target uh, network weights. You maintain two neural networks. One of them is called the target neural network. The other one is the one which you are training for. So you fix uh, the target uh, neural network with some constant weights. That is, you don't change the W's for that. So you get this target, uh, this label from the target uh, neural network because the weights are fixed. So during the training process, your targets won't change because only if this W changes, the label will, this value will change, right? So you will keep that fixed so that you will get the same target. And once in a while, you keep updating this WT for the target Q network. You freeze the target uh, network weights and train for some time so that at least for some times, the targets look stationary. And after some time, you just uh, update the target uh, network weights with whatever is the latest W that you have. Okay. So that is what we mean by uh, target Q network. So you just maintain a target Q network and uh, just fix the weights of the target Q network so that this W will look like it's a fixed thing. And then after some time, you just update the target to network weights with whatever your current latest weights that you have. Okay. Another issue uh, that uh, we were facing was in this Q learning updates, uh, like uh, we are updating Q of ST comma AT, right? For every, at every time we are updating one Q value, Q of ST comma AT. So uh, this, uh, this, uh, algorithm, this update of this W is based on this stochastic gradient descent algorithm, right? Or stochastic semi gradient algorithm, right? Uh, so, generally, the SGD algorithm is known to converge uh, when uh, the updates that you are making to the weights are in an IID fashion. The samples you are using to update your weights are chosen in an IID fashion. So, uh, if you are training the uh, weights, now you choose some sample in the next uh, training update, in the next iteration of the update, you choose another uh, random training sample. But here, uh, when you update some state ST comma AT, uh, time T, we'll update for state ST plus one comma AT plus one in the next time slot. And ST plus one depends on what ST is, right? Because ST plus one is the next state in your trajectory. So ST plus one has a lot of correlation with what ST is, right? So now we are making the updates in your stochastic gradient descent correlated. Like at some time T, you are using some sample for update. At time T plus one, what sample you are using for this update is uh, not independent of what you use at time T, right? So to break this correlation, we have uh, discussed a concept called uh, 
memory replay buffer what is memory replay buffer is you store the last uh, few uh, samples of data which you have seen you can store in this particular format so let's say you have seen some state st and you take you took some action ap and based on that let's say you got some reward and some next state you just store it in this uh, you just store it in this uh, format s a r s dash you just store these tuples like this in your memory buffer for the last uh, let's say how let's say you store the last 100 uh, interactions that you had with the environment in this particular format in this four tuple format okay now uh, at a given point of time what state action pair you want to update that you'll decide randomly you'll just pick randomly one of these 100 uh, last experiences that you have and do this update let's say instead of updating q of st comma at what you'll do is you'll pick one random uh, thing from this and what will be the update rule for this like what will be the sample estimate for this if you took if you are in state s and took action a what you should sub substitute here whatever reward you have observed during that time right so that we have already stored here which is r so you just use that r plus what what else you have to write it's like match server a q of uh, s dash comma a a dash let's say right so while making this update you just use this tuple which you stored you just select one of these last 100 experiences which you have and update the queue for that particular sample because s is everything that you need for this is already here right s is there which is required and a is there and r is there and s dash is also there so you just use the tuple and update your queue function based on uh that like here it's not as this one it's like s dash a dash of w like the estimate which you have okay uh is this concept of memory replay buffer clear so instead of updating uh st comma at you just take one random sample uh, random tuple from your last 100 uh, Uh, states in your trajectory and just update for that state the q of s comma a so that it will look like uh, the updates that you are making in successive iterations will not be correlated right because you are taking one random sample from this 100 uh, last previous experiences so right now you might update for one step one s comma a in the next step you will take one random sample from this 100 experiences and update it so that the successive updates in your stochastic gradient descent iteration will look like they are uh, uncorrelated okay so your behavioral policy will keep collecting uh, spat according to some policy like it will just keep this it will just generate the experiences and keep storing you don't have to update for spat at a given point of time you just keep continuing to generate the data according to whatever policy you are generating but uh, while updating you just update from your uh, storage the memory buffer okay is this clear i was going to high level i guess you understand mm -hmm. maybe i'll give you an assignment on this and you'll understand okay so so this is about the queue learning uh so D dqn like you have replaced uh, you, you have used a function approximator for q function and instead of using some linear function you are using some neural network but there will be some convergence issues because of uh, neural network uh, because the hgd has certain properties which are required so we made these two changes one is the target q network the other one is maintaining a replay buffer so there are a lot of variants for example instead of picking a random sample from your last 100 uh, experiences there is something called uh, priority experience replay buffer so instead of randomly picking one uh, you 
pick one which is of more useful like using some you will define some metric based on what is a useful sqma to update you try to give more priority to such sqmas so this uh, there is something called priority experience replay buffer but uh, we will not go into the details of that but uh, at a high level these are the main uh, concepts that are there in dqn okay so this this is a very popular paper uh, like the there is a paper by david silver uh, who has uh, because of this paper only deep learning deep rl became very famous like there is a paper on by david silver and his team uh, he is a research scientist at deep mind who has invented this alpha go like alpha go is a popular game RL agent which has won against the Go champions, right? So he is the scientist at Deep Mind who created this AlphaGo, and he had one of his papers on DQN uh, where he was designing a DQN-based RL agent for solving Atari games. Atari game, uh, and uh, he has shown uh, that he has made some minor changes to the DQN and like these two changes, and shown that it can. Uh, perform very well like the same agent can learn multiple games without much changes in the parameters etc okay so it's worth reading like you just search uh, dqn original paper by david silver you'll get i think the title is playing atari games using dqn or something okay so this is about uh, uh, the previous topic So now we'll try to continue with uh, the next topic, which is uh, policy gradient methods. So uh, till now, whatever we have looked at are uh, value-based methods in the sense that we are trying to understand what is the value of uh, taking some action in a given state, right? Uh, so, yeah. You have understood what are value-based methods and policy-based methods in the bandit setting as well, right? In the bandit setting, the UCB and uh, epsilon VD, etc. For everything, we were maintaining what is uh, mu bar of A, which is roughly the value of uh, playing that arm A. And based on the values of each arm, we were deciding which arm to play, right? For example, in epsilon VD algorithm, we'll have the values for... What is happening? We'll have the values for each arm. We'll have some estimate for the values for each arm. And then uh, we'll play the arm which has the highest uh, value with some probability 1 minus epsilon. And with some probability epsilon, we used to explore, right? So these are like value-based methods because we are trying to understand what is the value of playing some action first. And in policy-based methods, we are directly trying to understand what is a good policy. We are not first estimating what is the value for each action. Instead of that, we are directly trying to understand with what prob what action I should take in a given state, right? We are try directly trying to learn what is a good uh, policy, okay? So uh, some of the advantages of uh, policy-based methods is this can be helpful in uh, when you have continuous action spaces. Because uh, you if you have a lot of actions, you need not estimate the value for each uh, action separately. You directly understand what is the probability of playing some particular action. Okay. So if you have some continuous set of actions, then uh, this will be of more use, like policy-based methods are more useful. For example, let's say your actions are uh, some continuous action, let's say, your action is uh, which uh, maybe some real number which you have to decide let's say there is a uh, robot arm and you have to decide uh, in which angle you should move that arm okay so maybe the angle you can write it as some h1 h2 right or maybe the uh, coordinate where you should uh, go next let's say that is the action which you have to take so if there are two real numbers in your action let's say your action has uh, 
tuple like this then uh, for every real number you cannot learn what is a value separately right because there are infinite uh, actions that are possible here for every action you cannot go and learn what is mu bar of a what is mu bar of b because your action space is belongs to r square now like every every point on the coordinate system let's say is an action for you then you cannot go and learn separately then what we have done we have looked at uh, what is called parameterized representation of a policy which is roughly like uh, if this is your action what is the probability of taking this action a if i call this action as if i represent the action with some parameters like this a1 a2 so you can have some function like this right theta1 x1 plus theta2 x2 like this could be your uh, action like uh, maybe the you just normalize it appropriately that will become your probability of uh, playing that particular action in the quiz also we have seen one example right with policy i think we had a gaussian policy example right in the quiz one right uh, so you represent your policy using some uh, parameters theta and now you directly try to learn uh, what is the best theta for you okay so how did we represent what is the best policy let's say in your bandit setting every policy every theta will give you one policy theta is like a parameterization of your policy so specifying one theta will tell you what a policy is so how do we measure the performance of a policy by huh louder okay yeah so for example in the bandit setting we were looking at what is the expected uh, reward for playing that uh, for taking action according to policy pi right so uh, similarly we can do the same thing in the rl setting as well like full rl setting as well so going back to what are some advantages like this is one advantage which is the continuous action space and one more issue which we faced in the approximation based methods were when we were using value based methods like uh, monte carlo based function approximation td based function approximation we have seen that uh, if you remember we are while discussing the td based function approximation we mentioned that it's not exactly gradient descent but it's semi gradient descent right so that because of that only the convergence issues are coming the non stationary target was coming because of that but in policy gradient in policy methods we can use stochastic gradient descent without any issues we don't have to re revert to semi gradient method okay and one more main advantage uh, that we'll have with the uh, 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 policy based methods is in all the value based methods uh, what uh, we were looking only at deterministic policies right so what are we doing we were learning what is called uh, q star and we are taking pi star to be the arc max over a q star of s comma i right so we were assuming there is a like if you find what is q star you just take the arc max over a then you'll get uh, the pi star so we were looking only at the deterministic policies uh, if you recall in the one of the first uh, few lectures of rl uh, of this course we had mentioned that for every mtp there exists at least one deterministic policy which is optimal do you remember that like in the one of the few like initial few lectures we discussed this like instead of looking at all possible policies we just search only some deterministic policies like we assume that at least one there is at least one deterministic policy which is optimal policy right but uh, that approach that assumption or that result holds only when you are in the tabular setting that is when you are maintaining separate q value for every possible s comma a okay if you treat each state separately and each action separately and learn about what is the q value for every possible state s comma a then that assumption of the existence of a deterministic optimal policy holds but when you move from from that to this function approximation setting where you are not representing s yes, you are not treating each s yes separately but you are using some features for the state right because there are too many states to handle so we are using some feature representation for the states so when you move from the tabular setting to the function approximation setting 
that assumption of uh, at least one deterministic pol optimal policy existence is uh, not uh, valid okay in the tabular setting it is true for uh, if you have finite number of states and finite number of actions and your rewards are bounded if you have these three assumptions and and if you maintain separate value for each state and action then it is uh, true that uh, there exists one deterministic policy which is optimal but in the function approximation setting that is not uh, correct so let's see so that means uh, that means uh, i'll show you one uh, just for your understanding, I'll show you one problem where uh, the optimal policy will not be a deterministic policy. You can clearly understand from the example which I'm going to show that for that example, you can see easily see that there is no deterministic policy which will give you the optimal uh, value. But if you allow stochastic policies, uh, then you will understand that uh, the optimal policy is essentially a stochastic policy, which uh, we can understand. Okay. So let's look at this example where this is like a great example where uh, you can think of the green states here as the terminal states. Like uh, there are two cross states. If you reach those cross states, then uh, you'll have a minus 100 reward. And those are the two terminal states. And the middle green state has. Uh, is also a terminal state, but if you reach that, if you end up in that state, you will have a plus hundred reward. Okay, then uh, for this example, you, you can easily see that whatever I have drawn in this figure is the optimal policy, right? It's a optimal deterministic policy. If you because here we are treating each state separately. Okay, because uh, we are deciding what is the policy for each state separately, we can. If we treat each state separately without any function approximation, then it is very clear that uh, there is a deterministic policy which is optimal. You need not go for any stochastic policies, right? Because no other policy can give you better than this reward, right? Whatever policy you come up with, it cannot beat this reward, right? Because uh, now, for uh, starting from any state, you have a value which is hundred for this policy, right? Uh, wherever you start, if you follow this policy, you will get a value of 100 right so let's let's look at uh, how function approximation uh, uh, impacts this property of having a deterministic optimal policy so let's say we are making some function approximation uh, where uh, for every state we are creating four features okay which are uh, these four So for every state, we are just uh, creating a feature vector of length 4. What uh, are the features is whether there is a wall to the left, whether there is a wall to the right, whether there is a wall to the down, and whether there is a wall to the up. Okay. So for example, for this red state, what will be the feature vector? If it tries to move to the left, uh, it cannot go right. That's an end point. Like that's like a wall. Okay. It cannot move left. So whether there is a wall to the left, that is zero, right? There is no wall to the left. Where there is any wall to the right, it can move to the right, right? By wall, I mean dead end, okay? So this red state S1 can move to the right, right? So that, that means there is no... I think here there is a wall in the left, right? This is... Uh, for this red state, it cannot move left. That is, there is a wall on the left. On the right, there is no wall, right? So it's like uh, zero. And what about up for the red state? There is a wall, so it will be one. And down, it can move. There is no wall. So this is the feature vector for uh, the red state. So similarly, we can write the feature vectors for uh, every state like that, okay? So, for example, for the blue state, uh, uh, the feature vector will be 0, 0, 1, 1, okay? One thing that you could notice is, uh, if you look at the blue state and the green state, both these uh, states have the same features, right? Because there is a wall on the top and wall on the bottom. On left and right, there are no walls. 
So if you just look at the features, you, there is no distinction between state S3 and S2, right? Because both of them have the same feature vector, right? Looking at the feature, you cannot tell whether you are in S2 or S3, right? So now, let's say you are trying to model any policy uh, using these features. So what will the policy depend on? Policy is a function of your state S and S is represented using the features. So if you look at any deterministic policy uh, using which uh, decides what action to take based on the state features, it has to give the same action for both these states, right? Because your function, your policy is a function of your state features. And the state features are the same for both the blue, uh, the S2 and S3. So whatever policy you come up with, let's say any deterministic policy you come up with, if it is only taking input as the state features, then it has to output the same action for both these uh, states, right? So you can clearly see that uh, any deterministic policy will not be optimal, right? What is the issue? Because you have to decide only one action. You have to specify only one action for both these states because the features are the same. So let's say for both the deterministic policy says you take left action whenever you see these features. So then what will happen? So both of these will be left. Okay. So then what could happen? If you start in state S3, like for other states, there is no issue. Like you can have the same actions, but for these two states, the features are the same. So any deterministic policy, which is taking only the features as the input should give the same action in both these states. So let's say you give left for both these uh, things, then what will happen? When it starts from S2, it's fine. It will happily come to the dollar state. But if it starts from S3, what will happen? It will keep fluctuating, right? It will keep altering between S1 and S3 forever. So it will have a zero reward, right? So that is not an optimal policy, right? Similarly, if you give right for both these things, then also it's an issue, right? It will get stuck here. Correct? But what if we say, if we also allow uh, stochastic policies, okay? So instead of deterministic policies, let's say my stochastic policy is, uh, it can have some probability, right? It's It can take random actions. So what I'll say is, whenever you see the feature vector corresponding to S3, you either move left or right with equal probability, let's say. You, the policy at the state S3, which is same as the policy at state S2, is move left with probability half, move right with probability half. That is my stochastic policy. Okay. Then, uh, is that an optimal policy? Let's assume the discount factor is 1. Okay. It's an optimal policy, right? Because it will never fall into the cross states, so that there won't be any minus 100. And it will keep getting zero rewards till it is oscillates. So whenever it goes into the dollar state, it will get 100. So if you uh, take a random policy, which tells you either move left or right in the state S2, S3 with probability half, and all other states will have a deterministic, like we'll just say these actions with probability one, okay? For these states, we'll just keep these actions with probability one. For this state alone, For other states, we'll keep uh, deterministic uh, with probability one, we'll take this action. But for this state alone, we'll just say you take either left with probability half and right with probability half. Similarly, here also we'll say either take left with probability half, right with probability half. So when it comes to this state, maybe whenever it takes right, it will go to this state, again it will come back. But at some point, uh, it will take left, right? Because it's a random policy. It will keep oscillating for some time. But at some point, whenever it takes the right action left, it will come out of that loop. Correct? So then it will go here. So that means the value for that uh, state is what? 100, right? Because we are not having any penalty for staying more time in the grid. Because the gamma is 
one, right? You'll get zero 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 reward, and finally one plus hundred reward. So the value of that policy is plus hundred for every state. So now you can clearly understand, right? That for some MDPs, when we move from the tabular setting to the function approximation setting. A deterministic policy might not give you the best policy. No, it's not. It's not about like if you have a one-to-one -one mapping for every state to features, then what is the use of going to features? No, let's say there is a one-to-one -one mapping from every state to possible features then uh, there is no point of having features right you can just have the states itself the main thing is to go from many to one mapping right because a lot of uh, features if the features are similar we are assuming the action to be taken should be similar otherwise if we are having separate um, state for each feature like a separate feature for every state then you have to just use indicator as the feature whether it is uh, like you have, let's say, 10 states, you just create 10 one hot vectors saying that uh, you just create a feature vector saying whether that belongs to that state or not. Right? So you will have this kind of an issue like different states will look the same. That you cannot avoid when you go from, uh, when you go to the function approximation. Can you talk? No, you can. Maybe there will be some cases where uh, the deterministic policy will also be optimal. I'm not uh, saying that there, for any MDP, there will not be any deterministic policy which is optimal. All that I'm saying is there exists some MDPs for which uh, if you go for the function approximation setting, uh, the optimal policy need not be a deterministic policy. This is just a counter example. No, stochastic policies are, are the superset of deterministic policies, right? You can just take uh, probability one, that action. Stochastic, for example, here, I'm taking this action with probability one. So deterministic policies are like just a subset of stochastic policies. What? Can someone close that door? These kind of feature vectors work where? Mm. Mm. No, like there could be a lot of possibilities. All that I'm claiming is uh, if it was uh, tabular setting, you can always guarantee that uh, there is this one deterministic policy which is optimal. But once you move to the function approximation setting, we cannot give that guarantee. That's all I'm saying. This is just one counter example for that. So, like if you take some other features or some other things, like, or there could be some cases where it will work. All that I'm saying is that uh, the result is not the theorem which says that there is this one optimal deterministic policy is not valid under function approximation. For that, all that I have to do is give one counter example. This is a counter example. Okay. Okay, so let's see how we have to do uh, the policy gradient methods uh, in the uh, full RL setting. So just before that, I'll quickly recap how we have done that in the banded setting. Okay. So for any policy pi, how did we measure the performance of that policy? Using this uh, function called beta, which is just telling what is the expected reward, what is the expected reward that you'll get uh, for playing according to policy pi. Right. This is nothing but the expected reward for playing according to policy pi, right? This is the probability of playing according to policy pi. And this is the expected reward whenever you play according to policy pi. We are just taking the average. 
okay and our aim is uh, like every policy is represented by a parameter vector theta and we want to find the best policy so what we have to do is we have to just uh, maximize this function right it's a function of neta because every policy is determined by theta so we have to just maximize this function so for that what we can do is to uh, we can do gradient descent right you just uh, uh, take the gradient and keep uh, iterating in the positive direction of the gradient but what was the issue we faced in this uh, setting so what is the issue to do gradient descent on this uh, function the gradient requires mu of a which we do not know right what is mu of a the true mean of the true mean reward mean of uh, arm a which we do not know so what did we do instead of doing gradient descent what did we do we moved to stochastic gradient descent what was stochastic gradient descent if you can't compute the exact gradient you compute some other thing whose expectation will be equal to gradient right then we did some modifications to that and uh, we got this kind of an algorithm right so we showed that uh, this uh, this is like the stochastic gradient descent where theta nu equal to theta all plus some small constant into this term which is the reward like this is the, whose expectation will be equal to the gradient of that function meta right now we'll try to do the similar thing in the full rl setting okay so our objective in the uh, normal setting was uh, for the expected reward for a particular action but now we have what for we have states also which are coming into the picture right so what should be our objective to find a policy whose uh, value function is the largest right so here what we'll do is for but for every state you have a different value function right so what we'll do is we'll take the expected value function let's say you assume that there is a state distribution which is of interest for you let's say you assume that uh, there is a dis starting state distribution like s not is uh, uh, there is a starting state distribution from which you decide what is the starting state now we are just uh, a policy is good if the value function is good right now we are just trying to maximize the value function uh, assuming that there is some starting distribution s over s not and we are just looking at uh, the best policy according to this like if you always start at some deterministic state s not what will be a good policy a, a policy which ever has the highest uh, value function right from state s not but let's say you keep starting at different uh, places during different runs but uh, the assume let's assume that there is some starting state distribution which is given to us maybe there are some three four starting states uh, from which we can start and we are given with what probability you'll start from each of these states then we'll just take the expected value function where the expectation is with respect to this uh, starting state okay Uh, this is a meaningful way of looking at what is a good policy right is this definition clear what is j of theta this is the objective huh? like what is a good policy for us uh, a policy with a good uh, value right but uh, the value function itself is a vector like for every state you have a different value like one way is to have this Uh, definition of uh, the optimal policy as a policy whose value is strictly greater than some other policy in every state like a vector inequality that is one way the other way is you just take uh, for every state you have some value you just take uh, an expected uh, expectation with respect to that state if you have some distribution over the state space you just take the expectation of the value of with respect to that starting state 
okay so this is one uh, way of defining what is a good policy now what is our task once we agree that this is a good uh, metric to measure the performance of a policy what should we do now maximize this function j, j theta right j theta is telling what is the performance of a policy with parameter theta now we want to maximize this with respect to theta right um, so i can write the same thing like this right where so what is the definition of b pi of s not this is the definition right you start at state s not and uh, follow policy pi what is the expected return that you will get that is nothing but the definition of v pi of s not so i will just simply write it like this like uh, expectation of g not where your your starting state is according to d some distribution d and you follow policy pi i'm just writing it in this notation okay so now let's try to understand uh, whether whatever formula that we derived for the policy gradient descent in the bandit setting whether we can simply use that in this setup okay so for using that how you can think of as like what does g not depend on g not depends on the whole trajectory right you start at some state s not you will take multiple actions according to your policy pi and then you will get some lot of rewards and the total sum of all those rewards is your return so your g not is a function of your trajectory right so if you think each action as one trajectory okay so like there could be lot of trajectories that are possible so if you think each trajectory as one action so once you decide one trajectory you get a reward right g not you think of it like a one shot problem where you are deciding the tra trajectory then you get one reward so this is like there are a lot of trajectories you think each of each trajectory as a mom in your bandit problem you decide the trajectory you get the g g not is this clear because g not depends on what g not depends on this trajectory which you take right g not will be the sum of all the rewards that you have in this trajectory now if you fix the trajectory then g not you will get so th there are a lot of trajectories which are possible so you think each trajectory has some arm in your bandit setting and think of it like a one shot bandit problem you select one trajectory i'll give you a reward okay yeah okay think of every possible episode that you get when you follow policy pi as a arm so if you select a false trajectory you'll get a reward okay no this is a policy which this where this is a policy which you are trying to optimize this is just a variable just like this it is j of pi for a given policy what is the performance we will find the optimal pi okay so i can write the i can write this uh, thing i can write this value uh, like this right where uh, g of tau is the return that you will get when you follow the trajectory tau okay and i am looking at the expected value of that return when i uh for like every policy pi will put some uh, probability over every possible trajectory right so if i fix a policy pi if i fix a policy pi there will be some probability of following a given trajectory right so for example uh if i want to find what is the probability of seeing a trajectory tau when following policy pi that will be like this right 
what is the property that you start in state s not then what is the probability that you take uh, action a not when you are following policy pi and you are in given state s not then what is the probability that you will move to state s1 given that you are in state s not and took action a not right this is the probability of uh, following trajectory tau when you are acting according to pi right is this clear now you just think of it as uh, uh, the policy that you have in your bandit setup so now you know for every tau what is the probability of taking that tau if you follow policy pi right so just like in the bandit setup what does the policy tell you in the bandit setup if there are three actions it will tell what is the probability of taking action 1 what is the probability of taking action 2 what is the probability of taking action 3 right similar to that if i give you pi you can calculate this right theoretically for every possible trajectory if i specify the pi and uh, the dynamics of the mgp you know what is this probability so now it is like a bandit problem right once you fix pi then you can can calculate what is the pi of uh, every trajectory i see a lot of blank faces is it not clear ha huh? no you think every trajectory has some uh, uh, action okay now when i specify a policy pi when i specify a policy pi it is giving me what is the value for what is the probability that i'll take the trajectory right so this is like specifying and probability for every action in our bandit problem right once the trajectory is decided i'll then the reward is also uh, decided right if you give the trajectory then i know what is the return so i think of it like this like there is a policy pi which will sample one of the trajectories because i know what is the probability of uh, taking every trajectory with that policy pi and it will give me a reward which is nothing but the gt g not for that corresponding to the trajectory g of tau okay so now so now this is uh, so this was the gradient that we had right in the so if you look at uh, this uh, if you look at this thing what was the gradient that we had in the bandit setting theta nu equal to theta old plus alpha times the reward rt plus 1 for taking some particular action and the delta log of that policy pi what is the probability of taking that action at right so after every you take one action according to policy pi at and then you observe the reward rt plus 1 then you just substitute this update rule right similarly what we will do is uh, we will start with some arbitrary policy pi in our uh, uh, reinforcement learning setup then you run one episode with that uh, uh, policy pi then we'll get what we'll get gt so the gt is like rt plus 1 for us right here the gt is like the reward in the bandit setup then you can just substitute gt here instead of rt plus 1 you can just substitute uh, gt here what happened so instead of rt plus 1 you just substitute gt here which is the return that you got for that episode here what should i substitute like this will be what log pi log pi instead of 80 what should i substitute the trajectory right because each trajectory is like a action for us there so that's what we'll do so this is Uh, this is the probability of taking that trajectory tau now what i have to do del log of this 
so that's what i'll do here i'm just doing del log of that so this is p of tau and i'm just taking log and taking the derivative with respect to theta so i got this uh, i got this which is nothing but my uh, stochastic gradient descent like this will give me the update rule for my stochastic gradient so that that is what is uh, the so as i said this is what you will substitute in the so 40 plus 1 plus del log uh, pi of 8 at you will substitute this one so instead of 40 plus 1 you substitute p of tau and uh, here you are just substituting instead of uh, del log at you are just substituting del log pi of at right here del log pi of at that's what we had right in the bandit setup here we are just substituting del log pi of tau pi theta right okay is this clear so we are just uh, treating it like an analogous thing like in bandits you are taking some action like if you are given a policy you will choose your action based on that policy so just like that here if you are given a policy if you behave, behave according to that policy for one episode you will get one trajectory so you just behave according to that policy pi for one trajectory then you get the trajectory so looking at the trajectory you know what is d tau so that you that will be like your reward and now we are also looking at uh, what is the this term with respect to that there is nothing else here other than that you just have to understand this analogy so what is the probability del log at that is like del log pt here by okay so del log pi of at we had here here we will have del log of p of t because their action is like a trajectory here that is the only difference it is there so finally the update rule will look like this so you start with some arbitrary theta which will give you one policy you run one episode with respect to your current uh, policy and you will get uh, your return which is g of tau for that episode you just substitute that and this this one we know right pi pi we already know what is pi pi is a function of your theta right because your current iteration theta you know then you know this function you just take the gradient with respect to that properly and you substitute whatever ats and sts you have seen in that trajectory then you will get this value no st is that episode you have seen right like you have seen some episode right you start with some arbitrary theta you run one episode you will see some state actions right that is what i mean here you started with some state s not and took actions according to a not like policy pi then you keep going like that for one episode right you would have seen one whole episode based on that only you are writing g of tau also right so you just use that states whatever episode you have seen you just use those states and actions here so let's say the episode was s not a not s1 you will have seen one episode right you just substitute whatever values you have seen in that episode here you are not using all states these are all the states you have you see in an episode okay here we are uh, like this given st i mean that st could be a feature of the state it need not be the state as such your policy could be a function of your state features so maybe you'll observe only the state features you just look at substitute that only here okay 
Okay. Uh, is there no doubt? We can conclude this lecture.